You all know one of the little joys of working at the laboratory is all of that good security training we get uh, all the time. Uh, and there's a good question about that training, whether it helps or hinders, uh, particularly with the insider threat issue. Do we get so lulled by the continued uh, influx of information and guidance and quizzing on the rules and the like, uh, that, that it uh, dulls our, th our thinking about this problem, or does it keep us sharply tuned to the issues that require our, our attention? Uh, you all know the in insider threat problem has become increasingly prominent in our thinking about the, uh, the security of the laboratory, the security of the national security community more generally, the security of the nation as we face a series of new challenges. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation about the insider threat, but not a lot of good analysis, uh, at least done out in the open, unclassified world. Uh, and we have uh, today uh, uh, two fine authors of a very important new piece of work in this area. Uh, you've, you've read the flyer on the, on the book and, and the topic, uh, but their, their focus is a novel one. It's not on learning best practices, but it's on learning worst practices, uh, trying to examine the the mistakes that have been made and to derive lessons from them uh, f for all of us to, to discuss. And they proceed from an, from an analysis of organizational biases and personal biases that shape the way we end up following worst practices rather than best practices. Uh, our, uh, as I was walking in, uh, someone observed that when you have a topic like this with two superstars, uh, you know you're going to get something interesting. We do have two su superstars. Uh, and I thank both of you for carving out the time to come to the laboratory today to, to do this for us. Uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Bunn is uh, a professor of practice. Uh, I double-checked, had we left off a word from the flyer? He's a professor of practice at Harvard University and well-known to many in this room as one of the nation's leading experts on, on nuclear security. Uh, Scott Sagan is even better known to this room as a professor of political science at Stanford University with a deep and abiding knowledge in the kinds of issues that uh, engage us here at the laboratory. Uh, we are going to be, uh, their formal remarks will be recorded uh, and uh, the video will be posted at our website uh, as soon as it goes through the clearance review process. Uh, and um, then we will shut off the microphone and we'll have approximately uh, well, we'll shut off the recording, but we'll keep the microphone going uh, for approximately 45 minutes of Q&A that will be entirely off the record. Uh, and with that, please join me in welcoming our two guests this morning. Thanks, Scott. Can everyone hear me in the back? Great. Now, this project, Insider Threats, began when I published an article many years ago in Risk Analysis that had my favorite title for one of my articles, The Problem of Redundancy Problem, How Adding More Security Guards Can Cause Less Security. Matt wrote a critique of that piece, and through dialogue we recognized that we had theoretical ideas about how insider threats could play out in nuclear security, but really hadn't done much empirical work on the subject. There wasn't very much that was available. And so we decided that we would gather together individuals who had worked on the subject in different areas, not just in nuclear security, because one of the first things we recognized was that this area of research and understanding was very heavily siloed. Bismarck once said that only a fool learns from his mistakes. Wise people learn from other people's mistakes and that we had very little of that in the area of insider threats. There are some organizations that face insider threats all the time. Think about gambling industry, casinos. Think about diamond mines. They have very serious problems. Think about the jewelry industry. But there are other organizations that pride themselves on combating outsiders that emphasize loyalty and morale. And in those organizations, you might think that insiders are non-existent, but clearly they are existent. They're just rare. And because they're rare, we don't talk about them very much. 
We'd like to think that the US military is immune to this problem. The Air Force had Chris Cook, who sold the SAC secret launch codes to the Soviets. Navy had the John Walker conspiracy, four individuals, again, selling code books. The Army had Chelsea Manning giving away 750,000 documents to WikiLeaks. We'd like to think that the intel community is immune to insider threats. And yet we all know about the cases of Aldrich Ames in the CIA, Robert Hansen in the FBI, and of course Edward Snowden most recently with the NSA. And we would like to think that the laboratories, emphasizing loyalty and all the training, are immune to this problem. We know a lot about the Wen Ho Lee case in Los Alamos. Very little, although I'd like to hear what you think about the LLNL cases, Katie Lewing or Stuart Nozette. How well are you trained on past cases of Lawrence Livermore, insiders who have been arrested? Rocky Flats had a series of sabotage incidents before they were closed down. Much of this hits the press or hits a report, and then we don't know much about it. Therefore, we thought it would be very useful to gather together people who studied how insiders in other organizations were failed to be detected. Gathering together people on one hand who study jihadis, say how do they deal with insiders, and especially how do they deal with potential of trying to get insiders inside nuclear capabilities in order to have sabotage or theft. Hiring Thomas Heghammer and Andreas Dell, two of Europe's finest terrorist specialists. We hired Amy Ziegart from Stanford to write about the Fort Hood shooter. Jessica Stern, Ron Souten, Shouten, writing about Bruce Ivins and the anthrax case. Austin Long on green and blue attacks in Afghanistan. Matt and one of his students, Catherine Glynn, writing about insider security for casinos and pharmaceuticals. And then Matt and I, after gathering together with the support of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, all these individuals came up with what we thought would be a different kind of approach, not just focusing on best practices, which is a common approach. I don't know if, if the labs have a best practices guide, but the World Institute for Nuclear Security, the IAEA has best practices. We said, if we want to encourage vicarious learning, learning from other people's mistakes, we should talk openly, more openly than we do, about mistakes that people have made so that we can learn from each other's mistakes. So with tongue firmly in cheek, we published a worst practices guide to nuclear security that then got distributed at the World Institute for Nuclear Security, the IAEA. We know that copies have been distributed here. There were over 100 that have been ordered here. We don't know what you do with them, but we're pleased that they were ordered. And what we have in this book is an effort to put together the case studies and revise our worst practices guide. So I'm going to walk you through some of them. Matt will then take up the rest, because we really want to try to encourage a dialogue once we turn off the mics about what you think. Are there ones that are missing? Are there solutions that you individually or you as a lab have been trying out to see how well they've worked? What do you know from your professional life or your reading about these kinds of insider problems. Because what we've been struck with is how repeatedly well-meaning people ignore danger signs. Even some of the biggest red flags that in retrospective perspective are just glaring at you, are so obvious, are not when you take into account both personal, psychological variables that people have when they look at this problem or organizational problems, because organizations have lots of other things that they have to do other than worry about insiders. Worst practice number one, 
Assume that there are insiders in other organizations, but not in my organization. Just like NIMBY in the nuclear power area, not in my backyard, there's a tendency if you know the people that you're thinking could be potential insiders, you have affect bias, you like something about them, so you think that everything about them is better than it is. You think that you have rules that are in place to help protect against this. We are a loyal institution made up of loyal, good people. Therefore, we don't have an insider threat. The case that I want you to take away is one in which insiders assassinated the Prime Minister of India. Indira Gandhi, 1984, had gotten personal threats from the Sikh rebellion taking place in the Punjab. The Secret Service put on extra security guards for her personal residence, and personal detail. And she said, well, we are a multicultural, multi-religious society. I would want to make sure that there are no prejudices against Sikhs. And one of her personal favorites, Bent Sikh, someone who she often spoke with, was assigned, arranged for his cousin to be put on the same personal detail with him, conspired to be left alone with her and assassinated her in 1984. It can't happen here. One of the central lessons is to think about simply combating the complacency that comes in an otherwise very strong organization filled with usually loyal people. And the problem is exacerbated today because of questions of rapid radicalization. Bent Singh was a loyal guard for years, which is why Mrs. Gandhi liked him so much. He only became radicalized in the weeks before the assassination. Most recently in Belgium, Alias Bughalab had passed all the background checks, cleared for granted clearances in the reactor facility there. And between the time he got the check and when, he, when the check was over, uh, in just a few months after that, he left to fight. He left uh, to join ISIS in Syria. We don't know what his plans were or exactly the timing of when he left, nor do we know how unusual this case is. There are others Increasingly, we find from research that radicalization does not take very long. And therefore, it's one extra reason why we shouldn't assume that the background checks will solve the problem. Background checks are important. Personal reliability programs are important. Training exercises are important. But what we have seen is repeatedly, for a variety of reasons, they're not sufficient. They're only part of the answer. They're not perfect. A number of individuals train themselves how to counter those background checks, even lie detector tests. Loyal employees can be coerced. There are cases in the commercial banking area, but there are others where someone is not a malicious insider, but a coerced insider. And sometimes your loyalty to your family, if you're put in a really tough situation, can create a tension between your loyalty to an organization and a loyalty to your family. People can be radicalized after they pass the test and quickly. So we are reminding people that background checks do not confirm someone's character. They're a snapshot of where somebody is at that particular time. They are not a deep portrait.
when we talk about this, we often say, oh, we've got a problem. People understand that. They say, but people will suspect. People will know something. Someone will let something slip. There'll be a red flag. Now, our lesson number three is don't assume that red fla flags, even when they're red, even when they're flapping, that they'll be recognized as such because we are remarkably creative as human beings in figuring out ways to ignore information that is inconsistent with some of our prior beliefs. We are remarkably creative at ignoring information that disconfirms uh, things we don't, we hope that, that, that we, we like to see what we want to see, not what is really there. In a superb study of the Nidal Hassan case, Amy Ziegart, political scientist, colleague of mine at Stanford, notes how often Hassan voiced radical beliefs to his colleagues and notes that the FBI actually was reading his emails to Anwar al-Awlaki, the jihadi cleric calling for attacks on the United States. Hassan asked al-Awlaki whether it was appropriate for someone inside a military organization to attack individuals within his own military organization if they under jihad rules. And the FBI officer involved interpreted his emails as doing research so that he could better advise and understand anyone who came to him as one of the psychologists working for the Army. The Army system did have background checks, did have evidence in them that he was talking about his own radical beliefs. And yet the system was created in two ways to not pass on all information. One, it was created to give people a second chance. So that some things would be kept in your file at your original base, not when you left. And on top of that, there was concern that colleagues might fear being accused of being biased against a Muslim if that was the case. And individuals, when you faced problems with him, it was not just that he was voicing radical ideas, it was he was not doing a really good job. I think many of us have experienced in life being asked for a recommendation for someone who was not doing a particularly good job, or getting a phone call for somebody in your organization who you wouldn't mind seeing move on. And you very rarely say, oh, this person's not doing a good job. This person's been espousing some things that got us a little worried. It's a phenomenon called being packaged for export. <laughs> and repeatedly, in looking back on this, this was a phenomenon that Ziegart says you could see clearly happening here. In the nuclear area, think about Sharif Mobley, who worked from 2002 to 2008 for five different U.S. nuclear power plants before going to Yemen to work for Al-Qaeda. He was cleared for unescorted movement, not throughout every place, not through some of the vital, but in many other places he was, uh, worked unescorted. And yet he told some of his colleagues, quotes, we are brothers in the, um, we are brothers in the union, but if holy war breaks out, watch out. He called others infidels, and not one person who heard this ever reported it to anyone. They liked him. 
He was a brother in the Union. Jessica Stern and Ron Schouten produced a similar disturbing picture of a disturbing man, of a disturbed man, whom no one reported to others what was going on. Bruce Ivins was in therapy. His therapist said, we'd never give clearances to this guy. He expressed both hostility, lots of um, infatuation, unrequited very often from co-workers, or people, who, women he had been obsessed with in college and had followed and stalked. It's all in his records. Records are never reviewed. One individual that they interviewed for this, a, d a doctor tried to contact the police and quit her job when her supervisor dismissed it. Remarkably, the doctor never bothered to read the notes on Ivan's, later telling the FBI that it was his practice not to read notes if they were too long. She had written up so much about how disturbed this guy was that it went past the normal level of reading that he felt was appropriate, so he didn't bother. In March of 2001, he wrote to one of the female technicians that he was obsessed with and gave her both an excuse potentially to report, but also if you liked him, even just thought he was just eccentric, a reason not to. He wrote to her, I'm down to a point where there's some things that are eating away that I can't feel I can tell anyone. You're probably the easiest for me to talk to, but it's difficult for me to ask you not to tell anyone else what I say. That's a lot to ask for, and you may feel that you need to share it with others. Obviously, if someone says that he or she is about to commit a crime, you should share it with the right people. That's both giving her an excuse to do it, but also an excuse not to do it. Because a real criminal is not going to say, oh, you should report it. He complained about being paranoid. Very much the affect bias of someone who was likable in many ways made his co-workers say, oh, this is just Bruce being Bruce. Sorry, Bruce. <laughs> now, I don't know what the design basis threat for insiders is here at Livermore. But in looking at many organizations, Matt and I note how often there is a tendency partly because of assessments of threat and partly because of expenses, to say we're going to have a single, we're going to protect against a single insider. Sometimes an active insider, sometimes a passive insider, sometimes an active insider helping others, sometimes not. But single insider threats are seen as the most credible and conspiracies generally not. And yet, empirically, as the superb Sandia study about major heists shows, major heists are more commonly conspiracies than they are insiders. Than they are single insiders. And therefore, it occurs to us that you need to think about design basis threat in other ways that Design basis threat should not be a ceiling after which you never do anything, but it should be a guide and that you should always consider as you design programs how to deal with multiple insiders, even though that's much more expensive, less probable, but far more costly if this occurs. Let me turn it over to Matt for the next set of lessons. All right. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, 
I think you will find, if you read either the uh, Ziegart uh, chapter about uh, Nidal Hassan or the Stern and Choten chapter about Bruce Ivins, that, that you're just amazed at the scale of red flags that organizations are prepared to ignore. Scott didn't mention it, but it, uh, at one point, uh, one of Ivan's staff went to his boss and said, I'm afraid he's going to hurt me. And you know, what should I do? And all that supervisor did was say, oh, well, there's this part of the lab that he doesn't have access to at the moment. Why don't you just work there for the time being? And pursued no further reporting, no further investigation. I mean, if, if staff are afraid of people in your organization, you probably ought to do something about it. In any case, um, a fifth lesson is don't assume that any one protective measure is going to solve your problem. Uh, you know, the background checks we've already mentioned, portal monitors. Uh, actually, a colleague here at, at Livermore told me a story about uh, going to talk to a vendor of uh, portal monitors, and the vendor had a source that he was confident the monitor could detect, and, and uh, this particular Livermore expert was able to go through the monitor uh, three times out of five without it being uh, detected with that source in hand. Seals can be defeated. Um, the reliance on reporting, you know, that staff will report, we've already heard, uh, often fails. So you really need a comprehensive, multi-layered approach that creates as many complex obstacles to potential insiders uh, as possible. This is a, a, a drawing of the uh, amazing Antwerp Diamond Center uh, heist in 2003. This was a, a facility with just a really impressive security system that was nonetheless defeated by a gang of thieves that collected intelligence for over two years. If you ever want to read a, a great sort of true crime story, it's really sort of a real life Ocean's Eleven kind of uh, situation. Uh, the book Flawless uh, goes through this case in uh, considerable detail. Uh, so you really have to think hard and do creative vulnerability assessments and realistic testing of what's really going on. Another key issue is don't assume that you know, your security system is only the technical system. The, the culture of the organization makes a huge difference and disgruntlement of employees makes a huge difference or morale of employees. Um, so this is not an insider uh, episode that we're mentioning, but it's clearly an episode that had a huge aspect of a breakdown of security culture. This was the intrusion by an 82-year-old nun and two other elderly protesters at Y12. They, pat they, they went through multiple layers of alarmed uh, fencing, and there were alarms you know, on a pathway leading directly to the HEU building. And they, as you can see, they got right to the HEU building. They were singing songs. They were pounding on the building with hammers. They were painting it with blood and so on. Um, there were very heavily armed guards inside the building who heard the pounding and thought, huh, even though it's before dawn and nobody's uh, notified us about any construction, we'll assume it's construction that's going on out there and not bother to go check. Uh, they were eventually accosted by a single uh, guard um, who was the first person fired because he didn't, he, he sort of saw that they were protesters and didn't follow the procedure that would have protected him had they not been completely peaceful protesters but only disguised as uh, peaceful protesters. Turned out that part of the reason they didn't respond to the alarms was they, they'd had a lot of false alarms because they had tried to cut corners on installing a new intrusion detection system and sort of integrated it with some old stuff and that caused it to set off a lot more false alarms than usual. Uh, and then usually you would check out the false alarms with the cameras, but the cameras had been broken for months and nobody had yet bothered to fix them. And then, so you had to check out the false alarms with guards, but the guards, there were so many false alarms they'd gotten sick of it. So at that point, you may as well not have an intrusion detection system as no, nobody is really doing the assessment of the alarms. So on disgruntlement, uh, Chelsea Manning is a good example, although also an example of emotional disturbance being a key uh, factor. She was sort of 
beginning to understand her dawning transgender identity in the middle of the military that was still in don't ask, don't tell uh, mode. But she was also sort of generally unhappy, not good at her job. She kept showing up late. She was told that she was going to have her day a week off taken away because of her constant lateness. She got so angry, she flipped over the, the interview table and went for the gun rack in the room and had to be restrained. And then it was three weeks after that incident that she started downloading. Similarly, in the cyber world, uh, disgruntlement is almost always a factor. So in, in one uh, case done by the excellent uh, cyber insider group at Carnegie Mellon, uh, in the database they were looking at, 92% of the cases of cyber sabotage ha happened after some negative work event. Somebody had been reprimanded, somebody had been denied a promotion, um, somebody didn't get the raise they were expecting, somebody was told they were about to be fired, etc. And over half of those perpetrators were already, before the incident, perceived by other people in the organization as disgruntled. Uh, so there were indicators uh, ahead of time that weren't acted on. And many organizations have found that pretty simple steps can have a big impact on disgruntlement. Uh, if you set up a good you know, complaints program where there's somebody who will really listen and sort of validate and say, oh, I'm really sorry you're having that problem. That sounds like a really bad problem. And then occasionally act on it when there's a justified complaint, especially dealing with bullying bosses. Organizations have found you can greatly reduce disgruntlement for not very much money. Um, a seventh lesson is don't forget that the insiders may very well know about the security system and may be aware of weaknesses in the security system. So Robert Hansen, uh, like Aldrich James, one of the most devastating spies in US intelligence uh, history, gave a whole bunch of agents to the Russians or the Soviets at the time, um, or part of the time anyway, um, he was a counterintelligence agent. He was supposed to be looking for the spies. And so he was able to monitor the investigation that was trying to find who's the mole when he was the mole. And so he was able to adjust his espionage activities to avoid being caught by the kinds of investigation that were being done. Bruce Ivins would be another example of that because he was put on the investigation team because well, of his he, expertise. He wasn't asked. He insinuated himself onto the <laughs> investigation team. And was uh, able to pass on some false leads that got people focusing on some other very plausible potential problems but took attention away from himself. It gave him time to try to cover up more. So Snowden, similarly, he was an NSA systems administrator. Part of his job was looking for the cyber weaknesses in the system so that they could be patched. He knew about all the cyber weaknesses. Now, we don't know whether the reason he had himself transferred to Hawaii was that he knew that they hadn't installed yet the monitoring that would uh, notice uh, odd you know, quantities of downloading by people on the network. But it is a fact that he had himself transferred to Hawaii and that they hadn't yet installed that software uh, at that place. So he was able to use very simple web scraping tools to download this vast quantity of information without uh, being detected. And eighth lesson is, you know, you can set a lot of rules, but don't assume everybody's following them. I, I love this particular picture. This is a security door installed with US assistance at a Russian nuclear facility. And it's propped open. And what's amazing is it's propped open on the day the American investigators were there to take a photograph of it being propped open, which indicates that the people there really didn't get the concept that it was a problem, that it was uh, propped open. Um, but you know, this, I, I don't want to pick too much on my Russian colleagues, because these kinds of things happen in the United States as well. In both countries, we've had cases of guards patrolling with no ammunition in their guns. Um, guards turning off the intrusion detectors because they get annoyed by the false alarms. Uh, guards sleeping on duty is another thing that has uh, happened. And people violate security rules because it's inconvenient. You know, uh, 
for many organizations, depending on how the incentives are structured, but for many organizations, every hour you spend following the security rules is an hour you didn't spend on something that's probably more likely to get you a promotion or a raise or what have you. Uh, so the real practice often looks way different than what's in the rule book, and you've got to keep that uh, in mind. So I'd, I'd hate to pick too much on my colleagues at Y12, but they also had you know, another case of don't assume the rules are followed. Uh, there were tests of the security system there that were important because it affected the bonus of the organization running the security force, and they were uh, cheating. They were getting information ahead of time as to exactly when and where the adversaries were going to attack, which obviously makes it a lot easier to plan your defense. Um, and there, is, there are reports that I think are not fully confirmed that they were also tampering with uh, laser uh, equipment, basically putting the batteries for the detectors on their vests in upside down so that the guards were basically unkillable um, in the exercises. Um. A ninth lesson is uh, don't assume that only the consciously malicious people are a problem. Inadvertent insiders can be a problem as well. So this is the jailbreak in New York a couple of years ago, a facility that I believe had never had an escape uh, before. And there was one conscious insider who was having a sort of odd, nascent sexual relationship with one of the inmates. But there was also a uh, inadvertent insider who was thought he was uh, getting information from the inmates about things other inmates were doing that might be you know, problematic or what have you, and was, was giving the inmates things like you know, a screwdriver and some pliers and things that he thought were innocuous, um, but also gave them some hamburger from the other insider, and the hamburger it was a lot of hamburger, and it had hacksaws and things like that inside the uh, hamburger. Um, uh, so the inadvertent insider is a big issue in cyber, of course. You know, we all have issues with, you know, clicking on that link or that attachment uh, or what have you. And the phishing attacks that do that kind of thing are getting much more personalized and sophisticated than they used to be. And social media helps hackers personalize attacks of that kind because they can look at what people have posted on Facebook or Twitter or whatever and, and, and target something that seems plausible for that person. In my own case, um, I was organizing a meeting in my research group about Chinese nuclear forces. We had someone from what was then still called the Second Artillery coming, a uh, colleague at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington was coming to the meeting, and I got an email from her with an attachment saying, you know, here's my talk on threat reduction for the meeting. You know, can you take a look at it? You know, it's a known colleague about a real meeting that's about to happen, my subject. So of course I clicked on the attachment and, <laughs> and turned out she'd never sent such an email. Bunches of other people in her address book had gotten emails tailored to them. The FBI got involved, ultimately was traced to a PLA, you know, IP address in Shanghai or someplace like that. Um, so the, you gotta watch out for the, the inadvertent, unintentional uh, insider. And of course in cyber the intentional insider is an even worse problem than the uh, inadvertent one. And finally, you know, we have only 10. We went for uh, 10 commandments. Uh, there's a, a great line from the French negotiator uh, after World War I where he said, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson bores me with his 14 points. God himself had only 10. <laughs> um, uh, so don't assume that you're going to prevent everything. Think about mitigation as well of the things that don't get prevented. So this is obviously not a security incident. This is a safety incident in Fukushima. But it's clear that a little bit more effort on the mitigation side would have made a huge, huge difference. If they had had the ability to get electricity and water to those reactors sooner, the reactors wouldn't have melted and you would have had a very, very different uh, outcome. And there's a lot you can do, whether it's in a uh, intelligence organization, whether it's at a nuclear facility or whatever, to think through 
Well, even if there was an insider, can we limit the amount of damage uh, they could actually do? I mean, in the Chelsea Manning case, for example, why was a private having access to all the secret cables from diplomatic posts all over the world? This makes no sense. There's no obvious reason why a private would, would need that access. And if she had had access only to the things she actually needed for her job, then a much uh, reduced amount of damage would have been done. So we have this amazing chapter by Heckhammer and Daly that Scott mentioned that provides a lot of data on you know, going through the whole corpus of jihadi literature and postings on the dark web and so on of their sort of thinking and actions related to nuclear issues. And it's actually uh, sort of uh, 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 makes you feel a little better because it turns out jihadis talk about nuclear only very, very rarely, number one. And number two, as far as they could tell, there are no cases of, of jihadis actually discussing, oh, let's recruit an insider at a nuclear facility. Um, on the other hand, as a caveat to that caveat, um, it's clear that almost all the, ca the real cases we know of, of theft of highly enriched uranium or plutonium or sabotage of nuclear facilities, and by the way, there are, people don't realize there are a bunch of those cases, um, uh, were perpetrated either by insiders or with help uh, from insiders. Only a very few exceptions. Um, and jihadists do routinely use insiders in other contexts. Um, so this recent attack in Afghanistan that uh, killed over 100 uh, Afghan soldiers at a military base in Afghanistan, there were reportedly four insiders at the base uh, collaborating with the attackers. Um, and this case of Ilyas Bugalab uh, is interesting. This, uh, many people don't realize that in 2014, there was a major reactor sabotage in Belgium at the Doel 4 reactor. Uh, an insider who still has never been identified uh, opened uh, a valve and allowed all the coolant for the turbine to drain out. The coolant, the turbine overheated and destroyed itself. If you count the cost of replacing the turbine and the cost of replacing the electricity while the reactor was down, it's something like $200 million in damage. So it's one of the biggest economic sabotages of all time. Um, and when they started doing the investigation, they found, oh, well, this isn't the guy because he was already gone for almost two years by the time it happened. But we had a guy who, as Scott mentioned, was cleared for access to the vital areas of the plant who had resigned to go fight for terrorists in Syria. Well, he left when ISIS was still saying, come fight for us in Syria. But then after that, ISIS started saying, no, 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 stay where you are and carry out attacks there. What might have happened had Ilyas Bugalab still been at the reactor when they changed their messaging? We don't know. So I think while it's true that uh, uh, jihadists haven't talked openly very much uh, about this potential tactic, I think it's something we need to worry about anyway. All right, so what should organizations do? Um, I think there's a lot of people in this room who know more about the answer to that question than we do, but these are our sort of initial thoughts drawing from across these different organizations. First of all, you can't just focus on security. You've got to have a high-performance culture generally to get your organization's mission done. Um, and so you have to find ways to build a culture that is both high-performance and high-vigilance at the same time. Some, a culture where everyone understands that security isn't just something that those security guys over there do. It's something that we all have to be doing together. Um, I mentioned already this sort of comprehensive, multi-layered approach that creates many different complicated challenges for insiders to get past in order to do any significant damage. And one of the things that I think is especially important and often not done as well as it needs to be is the sort of really sort of creative vulnerability assessment with people really looking for vulnerabilities. Often, people want a vulnerability assessment that tells them everything's fine. Uh, and that's not what you should want. Uh, 
my uh, colleague Roger Johnston has this hilarious but educational uh, set of what he calls security maxims uh, posted on the web. And one of them is the thanks for nothing maxim, which is any, any vulnerability assessment that finds no vulnerabilities or very few is incompetent and wrong. <laughs> um, uh, you need to design the approach within the context of your organization your country, so different countries have different rules, different ideas about privacy, uh, et cetera. Different organizations have different rules and, and cultures. I mean, one of the reasons there's a chapter in the book about casinos and uh, folk, the pharmaceutical folks who make really sort of things people want to steal, like OxyContin, um, is we thought, well, gee, they have a profit incentive to get the answer right on insider protection. I wonder what they've come up with. But the, the environment of a casino is so radically different. You know, you've got thousands of people coming in, and you want them to be coming in, and you want them to go out without being searched, and so on. Um, you have to design the, your insider threat protection for this totally different environment and culture, and so on. So you need a bunch of key elements of a comprehensive approach. I won't go through all of them. Background checks are obvious. But you need ongoing monitoring because people can change. And people can change more rapidly than the, you know, every five years or whatever that you might be doing your re-clearances. One thing I think is especially important is really effective training. Uh, so we heard at the very beginning about the kind of training where you have long lists of rules that you know, are read out and so on. That's A, boring. B, people forget. What you need is sort of real stories of terrible things happening from insiders and how the security system is designed to prevent those things from happening. People remember stories in a way that they don't remember lists of rules uh, or what have you. Um, Another key element, I think, is this last one, which is having an investigations process that the staff feel is fair and reasonable. If you create a process where you know, people's heads get chopped off instantly the moment anybody reports, nobody's going to report because they're like, oh, well, it's not bad enough to you know, lead to whatever would happen then. Whereas if you have a process where you know, people are regularly reporting on themselves, you know, oh, I've got, I'm taking this drug at the moment, so I should be off, you know, access for the next couple of weeks uh, until that's done or whatever. And, and also where people understand that part of the consequence of reporting might be that somebody who needs help gets help. Um, then it's, you, you can in, create better incentives for people to sort of pay attention to the insider program, so integrate it to some extent with the employee assistance program. Um, Bruce Ivins, for example, had he gotten the help that he needed, he'd still be alive, and a lot of other people would still be alive. Uh, and because uh, um, he was a, a guy who had very serious mental illness. And, uh, clearly wasn't getting the help he needed. So I am going to uh, leave it there, and we'll... Well, then, then, just before we open up, I just wanted to um, say what we've done in the past. Um, Matt and I have really have been heartened by the reception of both the Worst Practices Guide and the book here. We've briefed this at the World Institute of Nuclear Security, both in Vienna and in a special meeting that they held in South Africa. We've briefed at Sandia at Los Alamos. Just last week, we briefed at DOE uh, NSA. And what we have found to be very helpful is to turn off the mics and have you not just ask questions, but for you to tell stories, for you to comment on what you know from your own organization um, and elsewhere, and especially interested in trade-offs. It's very, very hard to, to recognize and we want to make sure that we understand that insider threats are not the only things that people do. Right. And part of the problem is it's hard to deal with this on top of everything else that you have to pay for, that you have to be aware of, that you have to deal with your colleagues about. And therefore, we do believe that an open talking about these problems is at least a first start. So thank Brad and, and 
Mona and GSR for hosting us here, but I also thank you, not just for listening, but for what I think will be a very uh, useful discussion. Thank you. <laughs>